Good evening, everyone. I am Bridget Winter. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm the executive director at Young Playwrights Theater. I am thrilled to welcome you tonight to the premiere of Silence is Violence, The New Normal. Tonight's performance is the first in-person production that YPT has been able to share since 2019, so it's a pretty special evening for us. It's also the first performance we presented by simultaneous live stream, which is something we plan to do for our productions moving forward. We are a 27-year-old arts education organization and producing theater company based in the Tacoma neighborhood of Washington, D.C. And our mission is to inspire young people to realize the power of their own voices. We do that through a variety of in-school and after-school playwriting and storytelling programs and through productions of theatrical work created by young and emerging playwrights. At YPT, we believe that young people are inherently brilliant and we exist to share that brilliance with the world. The show you'll see tonight is part of our Silence is Violence performance series. Launched in 2015 by YPT's artistic director, Farrah Lawal Harris, this series is YPT's most immediate route of addressing social justice issues affecting youth and their communities through performance and community dialogue. The play that you're about to watch includes original writing by 30 youth and adult writers, including students here at Prince George's Community College and also at DC's New Arts Institute for Creative Advancement, as well as YPT board and staff members and community members from across the Washington DC region who responded to our very first open call for writers earlier this spring. All of these writers created original work exploring this moment of continued uncertainty in 2023 and then offering up dreams and challenges for the near future in 2026. It's a really beautiful piece and I'm so happy to be able to share it with you tonight. This production would not have been possible without the support of so many people, and I want to highlight a few special thanks before we get started. So thank you first to all of our funders and donors, and especially to the Paul M. Angel Foundation and the DC Mayor's Office on LGBTQ Affairs for your generous support of our Silence is Violent series. Thank you to Dr. Gary Fry and the Prince George's Community College Center for the Performing Arts for providing both this beautiful venue and our technical support tonight. Thank you to the YPT Board of Directors, our amazing 11 staff members, our volunteers this evening, our 30 writers, and our brilliant cast, director, stage manager, and crew for bringing this show to life. Thank you to Farah Lawal Harris for developing the beautiful vision for this performance series and building it over the past nine years. And thank you to all of you uh, in our in-person and virtual audience for coming out to celebrate our writers and experience the show tonight. Without further ado, I am happy to introduce Nico Ramos, our MC and featured poet for the evening. Enjoy the show. Today we question if two things can ring true at the same time. Safety and joy. With safety we have the protection. With safety we have weapons. Whether a mask or gloves, nutritional vitamins or prescribed drugs, or simply put, a no. With joy we have the unapologetic and unashamed fun. The pandemic has truly taught us the value of fun. It taught us new ways to have it. Today, with all of our questions and concerns, we have more simple things to yearn, like the times when we would be gathered in the basement playing cards, drinking, and laughing. Or the times when we would go to crowded concerts to see our favorite artists. Safety makes us free, though. It gives us the motivation for our answers. It gives us hope and helps us breathe. It gives us the courage to stay or leave, and we can choose whether to be a wallflower or a dancer, be at all of the events, or simply be well-rested. Joy comes to us when we receive exactly what we give and more, and we have more open doors because of our genuine investments. Today, I balance equality with equity. I am grateful for the boundaries that are protecting me, and I proclaim that being here is simply enough. Welcome 
to silence his violence, the new normal, a night of dreaming and reflection as the global pandemic turns three by Young Playwrights Theater. Part one, the new normal, with a featured original pieces by Madison Chapman, Jamal Graves, Cody Bond, Katie Williams, Jared Schamberger, Anna Slazinski, and the YPT board members. Community isn't safe anymore. Locked down, locked in, locked out of my neighborhood. Everyone for themselves. Don't go to work. You, you have, have to, to go, go to, to work. work. Work from home. Home, home is work, work now. now. Home isn't safe. Home isn't home. Don't get too close. Uh, six feet away, please. Where is your mask? Put on a mask. <coughs> Was that a cough? My throat feels weird. Uh, do I have it? Do you have it? Uh, wash your hands. Uh, uh, wash your groceries. Uh, don't touch your face. It's on your shoes. There's a vaccine. Are you going to get it? I don't trust them. I don't trust them. They've lied before. They don't even know where it came from. Someone's died. A lot of someone's died. The schools are reopening. Why are the schools reopening? Go back to work? Is it safe? Is it smart? Is it over? People are outside again. No masks, no worries. What was that? It sounded like gunshots. Can't be gunshots, not here. Sirens, more sirens, text messages. Did you hear what happened? Community isn't safe anymore. Locked down, locked in, locked out of my neighborhood. Everyone for themselves. Don't go outside. You have to go to work. To work from home. Home is it safe? Home isn't home. Walking back into my classroom in August 2021 was like walking into a museum. March 13, 2020, on the board. Ungraded student work and dust filled my desk. 13 months of distance learning behind us. 13 months of distance created between us. I felt nervous, anxious, stressed. Did, did I even remember how to be an in-person teacher? Would I feel safe in a room with this many people? Will the students be OK? That became my focus. Would the students be OK? Still an unanswered question for me. The learning lost. The social skills untapped, their growth unsupported and unrecognized. I don't know if we'll ever stop feeling the effects of the pandemic on young people. I guess this is the new normal. Educators are burnt out. But more important than ever, students are behind. But the expectations have remained the same. How do we respond to student need in the moment while also knowing the challenges that face them in the future? How do we honor the place they're in right now while also pushing them to those other standards? Do I even agree with those standards? So much 
has changed. Yet the pressure on young people stays the same. I guess this is a new normal, if normal is the standard. Folks wouldn't have to suffer. There was more love for you. Today in 2023, I am feeling excited. I am grateful to be alive and I'm excited for new opportunities. I'm grateful to be here today to tell my story and to express my feelings. Before COVID, I had plans to write my first short film on YouTube. Instead of that, I continued cutting hair and got my master barber license. <laughs> I miss life before pandemic. I am proud of my accomplishments now, but I do miss the norm of being with family and friends and having regular festivities without the fear of getting sick. I worry that this pandemic is the new norm and that this is life in 2023, which affects our lives in every single way. I have learned that nothing is promised and I will continue to live in the moment and learn and love and grow into the best version of myself I can be. Today in 2023, I am stunned and joyful. I am grateful to be healthy. Before COVID, I had plans to continue my life essentially as I had been. Single, professional, content driven. Instead of that, I am married and expecting my first child. I miss the camaraderie of early pandemic days. I miss the slower pace. I miss the joy of being outside with so many strangers and neighbors enjoying nature. I worry that we are not addressing the global anxiety we're experiencing in the wake of this trauma, especially for young people. I don't believe we have the tools to do so. I have learned to listen more deeply and honestly to others. And I will continue to take longer dog walks, spend more time in quiet. Today in 2023, I am happy and exhausted. I have all the things I wanted so bad before the pandemic, but the return to social gatherings has me drained. I'm grateful to be in a place of people more accepting and thoughtful than I ever thought I would have in my life. Before COVID, I had plans to visit a museum in DC every weekend. It's one of my favorite things to do in DC. Instead of that, I started cooking more foods I had never tried and returned to some old hobbies I hadn't had time to think about in years. I played some board games, played more role playing games, learned some biography skills, and revisited my love of Transformers. Now that the world is reopened, I take more time deciding where to go and walk every aisle while grocery shopping. Weird, I know, but you never know when you won't get the chance to go out again, so I make it worth it. I miss the mental and physical breaks I had away from people. My social battery is short, but my partner is charged by activities, so I'm always a little tired. I worry that another extreme version of the pandemic is around the corner. People are already relaxed, but there's still cases and people dying. Not to mention the entire sect that just didn't care people died. It's like a lot of people didn't learn anything. I have learned that boundaries, <laughs> even when you're stuck in a small apartment, married, close friends, or whatever, are one of the most important things to surviving with other people. And I will continue experiencing new things and trying new hobbies. It feels like the pandemic broke the monotony of life for a lot of people. It at least threw some into the mindset of trying new things more often. And I'm lucky that a lot of my friends fall into that group. <laughs> Today in 2023, 
I am uncertain. No one can be certain of anything anymore. I miss making plans for my weekend and not having to cancel everything by Friday. Too much risk. Now we play the wait and see game each week. Will we have to cancel another dinner, a dance class, or another dream that we pinned on the calendar? Now I work from my home, which often feels like a straitjacket, a place of confinement rather than rest. If I'm not careful, I can become horribly lonely by Wednesday. I am grateful to be here and to be well, unlike so many others. To have kept my home and my job, to be aware of each day rolling out before me, despite the uncertainty. Now that the world is reopened again, and we're all speeding up, speed walking back into the productivity that we call our lives, I worry that we are forgetting the precious perspective that COVID gave us. Pets are returned to shelters. Art projects are abandoned. Gardens are grown over with grass. Food is no longer homemade. Friends are no longer calling to ask, are you still okay? I can live with uncertainty, but so long as I continue to find stillness and savor each day or hour, in whatever form it takes. It's crazy to think I was once a man. Not that in some ways I still am, but it's evident that's not who I ever was. I like my baths. I like leggings. I like being comfortable with who I want to be. If I learned anything from the past three years, it is that there's no point in hiding anymore. Who will I lose? The same five people I couldn't see anyway. There's still pressure. There's still childhood influence. I am me. I haven't changed. The expectations on me, the idea of me may have changed for other people, but I have always known me. In the years to come, it's up to y'all to figure out who I am. It's not my responsibility to explain it every day. First of all, it's doing everything a mother would do. Getting them ready for bed, feeding them, bathing them, putting them to bed on time, buying them clothes, fixing their hair day after day. It's like there's this invisible, unspoken expectation that you have to step up to the plate and be the mom of the household. You have to be everything a mother is. A comforter, a caregiver, nurturer, being patient, supportive and empathetic, but yet you aren't their real mom. You don't get flowers or homemade cards on Mother's Day. You don't get to feel that deep motherly connection with them. Early on in my journey as a stepmom, I had a miscarriage. It was one of the hardest things I've ever experienced, going from pure joy and excitement to a dark, ugly place of immense grief and hopelessness. There were days I felt stuck in this immense heaviness with no antidote or way to make it go away. I felt lost, stuck and unsure how to survive in this alternate reality of grief that I now faced every single day. For months, I couldn't look at my stepdaughter without having to choke back tears. Every time I saw her, I was reminded of my baby that I wouldn't get to hold, my baby that I wouldn't hear call me mom, 
my baby that I wouldn't get to love and nurture through their life the way a mother would. It felt so unfair and cruel that I had lost my own baby, yet still had to muster the strength to be there for someone else's child. I felt like a cheap substitute, the fake mom who doesn't get to be a real mom, who does everything a mother would without all of the perks. With time, the feelings of grief have lessened, even though they are still there to this day. But today, I have more hope, trusting and believing that one day when the time is right, I will get to be a mother to my own children. And that has made me even more grateful to be a stepmother. Step parenting is a role I never thought I would find myself in. Sometimes it feels like more of a responsibility than a blessing, especially when you're learning to move forward with grief. But at the end of the day, it's all worth it. Because the bond that I have developed with my stepdaughter, well, that's becoming one of the most important things in my life, as unique and unconventional as it is. Twenty-three. I am uneasy, hmm. thankful slash blessed. I'm grateful to be alive, uh, employed, healthy, reasonably successful, <laughs> loved by friends and family, hmm. a dog dad. <laughs> Today in 2023, I am busy and tired. I am grateful to be employed and alive. I feel tired and concerned. I'm extremely grateful and excited about the future. Oh, and I am really grateful. <laughs> uh, to, to be continuously moving forward on the right path. <laughs> I am grateful to be a father supporting my loving family. Uh, before COVID, I had plans to travel to several countries across the globe. Instead of that, I ended up spending a lot of time reflecting. Teaching more classes online, uh, checking in with friends and family more frequently, still trying to get out as much as I could to do things. Mm. I had plans to go to Italy. Instead mm. of that, I'm trying to balance the new normal. I had plans to have a huge retirement party. Instead of that, I decided to forego the celebration. Mm. Before COVID, I was content. I don't miss anything about the early pandemic. I miss people checking in with each other regularly. <laughs> being able to get to work in 20 minutes as opposed to an hour. I miss just being still. I worry we forgot how to be kind to each other. What concerns me is the U.S. going to war with China, and when will the war end in Ukraine? I worry about people's health. I have learned that life goes fast. I have learned that life is short. So live life to the fullest and enjoy both little and big moments, and to be thankful for what you have. Hmm. I have learned that I am an adult. And I will continue to support my family. And I will continue enjoying special moments with loved ones. <laughs> and I will believe in science. <laughs> I will continue to be patient with my seven-year-old mm -hmm. son. <laughs> and I. No, what We will continue Act One with original pieces by Lauren V. Miller, Corbin Ford, Bridget Winter, Madison Chapman. Tristan Willis, Dustin Blottenberger, Ashakile Finn, Farrell Wall Harris,
Michelle Walters, and students at the Prince George's County Community College. War times met with real-time childhood trauma. Strange interventions meet with community force, fighting for individual freedom. Little child watches mommy and daddy go off to war. Little child doesn't understand. I don't understand. Does the pain from the gain strain from the game of agitations and aspirations for freedom? What does democracy mean? Is it the red, brown, black, and white that lie down from desolate wars and march up towards glistening sun? There are so many questions and not enough answers to face the realities and complexities that exist within society hierarchies intending to tear down instead of build up. From plotted insurrection, to rigged elections, to unenforced protections. These are some of the world's imperfections. Mass genocides, diasporas on all sides, not to mention climate cries, battle cries, corrupted eyes, justice lies, baby cries, loud cries shouting, democracy, democracy has died. died. Protection is no longer our appetite. Time is expired. These are crimes against humanity. This is insanity. Insanity warfare. Joker card game. It doesn't matter where. Late nights, pull over. There goes the tank, stop there. Hold your breath. Thoughts scattered. Existence matters. Doesn't matter. Existence is not a gift for us, but a cursed whip wrapped around one's neck. Or anchored to one's leg. Breathe. What does it mean to exist? to resist one's existence. Our stance is fully clear. We march aside, push aside, point blank, boom, boom goes the sign. Sign up for freedom. Ready to fight? Fight not with bullets, fight with words. The biggest enemy we face is the one who can silence our words. But we will not be silenced. No, we will take our stand. We don't have to move mountains, we just have to hold hands. We want to live in a world where the mindset is love thy neighbor, where justice reigns and rides. But we live in a world where our canvas is so deeply smeared with oil, we can't even see the picture anymore. We live in a world where everyone wants to be the loudest voice in the room, where everyone wants to hold the microphone. Notice the grip on the microphone. Fix your eyes on the fingers. How do they wrap? Ask yourself, do they tremble? Or are they firm? Do not be mistaken. Shaking hands feel safer than firm ones these days. And do not forget the people. Hear the voice of the people. Let the people be for the people, by the people, and of the people. Hear them sing. Hear, Hear them, them chant. chant. Don't contemplate their voices. Elevate them. Ignite them. Light the fire into action and see the chemical reaction of change. Please do not be mistaken with these resolutions in mind as is the interest of mine to keep these things in our mind. I do not say these things just to pass time. It is past time our world stops digressing from patterns of poetic voices, censored under dictator serpents, along using sap with vines from bleeding trees. Trees! trees. Vessels for oxygen. We are like trees. We are like oak trees. No, we are oak trees. We are firm when the storm comes, tolerant when fire burns, and we are big and bright as when the sun rises. We are sunrises, not momentary flares. We are movers. Oh, oh they, they will stand. stand. But we are brighter than they say we are because our time has come. It is time to light the fire for our desire to rise higher. That outweighs the choirs of voices that tell us to slow down when we speed up. We speed up. We stand up. The little children stand up. We all stand up. I understand now. The vision is clear. Rise, rise up and stand up. Democracy is near. serve sound bites like tennis balls or maybe sharpened knives. Like your body is a game to win, a weapon to wield, but certainly not 
definitely not yours. It's knowing that abortion is healthcare. Abortion is freedom. Abortion is justice. Abortion is joy. It's knowing that abortion saves lives. And also knowing that your access is always dependent on your paycheck, on your address, on whether you're already marginalized in any of the too many ways that make American healthcare as likely to kill you as heal you. It's a story tingling on the tip of your tongue about being one in four. It's wondering if poems can be subpoenaed and wishing your body was a knife. Three years into the pandemic, and yet another new subvariant of the coronavirus has emerged. As William Brennan explains, it's spreading rapidly and it's driving an uptick in new infections. <sighs> this new old Immunocompromised in 2023? In a pandemic that feels endless to me. Seeing others operate with COVID is just a distant memory. Presenting healthy, young, and strong is a privilege I benefit from. But this pressure to maintain the facade makes my already weak body feel crushed from the outside. Is it safe to go there? To be here? To go anywhere? Each day is a risk, but one that is getting harder and harder to avoid. My body is my body, but there is only so much I can do to protect it. I've battled, I've lost, I've been knocked down, I've been tested, tried, pushed to the side, it's been taken from me, but apparently, Looking forward can be challenging, but without it, each day feels like a rabbit hole. In this body, two things can be true at the same time. Pain, weakness, deterioration, but also flexibility, expression, power, strength, all of these stories, all of this joy, all of this pain wrapped up in this body of mine that you look at every day and never blink an eye. It's hard to describe what it's like or actually, mostly it's just hard not to anticipate eye rolls or sighs or general shifty, itchy discomfort from the reminder that it's not over. Mostly it's hard not to stop before you begin just to conserve energy. People would rather chill out than talk about eugenics. The US history of ugly laws You'd rather chill out too. <laughs> it's navigating a multitude of steps and prep just to chill out with the ones you care about. Or actually, the people you care about who willingly navigate the steps and prep. The numbers dwindle. It's pounding a fist on the floor and yelling, I still exist! I still exist! I still exist! to anyone who will listen, which is probably just the downstairs neighbors who oftentimes seem to be yelling the facts of their existence. And maybe in this, there is some camaraderie and understanding. And hopefully, you think they get it. And you let the moment pass without interference. But part of you also thinks, who cares who gets it anymore? You know, ugly laws for about 100 years. U.S. ugly laws made it illegal for ill, disabled, and otherwise unsightly people to be in public. But it made exceptions and allowances for performances or presentations to disgust and frighten others. Sometimes people look at your mask with dagger eyes and you think, are they annoyed? 
Like, just chill out. Even the CDC isn't concerned anymore. Or have you just reminded them of the frailty of their own existence? First of all, it's the look on the nurse's face when they give you the test results. Pity pulls her smile taut and your sudden realization that despite no one saying anything, something is very, very wrong. The doctor will be in to talk to you soon. A thing you will hear many, many times from here on out. Second of all, it's a rich full week's worth of IVs and needles, CT scans and MRIs. The 144th Westminster Kennel Club dog show Wheelchairs, gurneys, blood, tears, panic, grief, overworked nurses and doctors who probably don't know what is right around the corner for them, and some big, big words that mean very simple things. Part of you is broken. It's lying naked, strapped to a stainless steel table while a distracted tech who neither knows you nor acknowledges your attempts at nervous humor shaves the hair off your thighs and genitals to clear the way to your femoral artery. It's feeling the life you just had fall off your body and get swept up with the broom, and then feeling somewhat desperate for the next step, for sleeping and numbing and excruciating pain, and then learning to do everything in your life over again. And then a very nice doctor who you irrationally dislike tells you, my recommendation is to do nothing. It's being told you are broken. And then being told that no one will fix you. It's coming home and failing to come to terms with the fact that things you love to do with your body could kill you. And on your third day back at work, they tell everyone not to come in tomorrow. There's this big thing happening here. And it's not even the one you're already dealing with. And over the next year, it's hiding and surviving and the birds' as early songs of spring overtaking the blustering of people now strangely still. It's feeling guilty as you walk but never run because you wish that it could always be this way just for a different reason. And it's discovering hope scrawled in electric blueberry and pastel lemon on a rough, bumpy black asphalt promising there will be an after. Perseverance, I can't give up. Nor can I look at those on social media who only show what they want others to see. I don't know what they went through to gain their quick success. So this year, I vow to only focus on me. <laughs> My mind often wanders to me being a director on a movie set with a pink megaphone. I see it in my right hand as I sit in a black director's high chair with gold letters, A, M, F, and better on the back of it. The joy I'm feeling brings tears to my eyes because my prayers have finally come true. Looking up to the heavens, being thankful for my dreams, I made it through. But soon, I hear an alarm and I wake up from another dream and realize everything is in my head and what I thought it was, wasn't what it seemed. <laughs> Guess I'll keep working. Real dreamers know what I mean. <laughs> In 2007, these hands had really only been used for light labor, administrative duties and retail rigmarole, you know, typing really fast, the occasional fax, unpacking new shoes for display, unwrapping white plastic bags that say, have a nice day. Then I got cast in a play, The Colored Museum by George Sewell. 
In 2007, I was 23. These hands were hard at work. Marking up my script, scribbling notes from Scott, young actor emoting because I was working double duty, performing two roles, the kid and taxi. Well, triple if you count the required technical credit, you know, liberal arts college shit. You can't just be a performer. You should know how to do everything. I knew nothing about table saws, but was placed in the scene shop to build a dresser for the play. Tim gave me detailed instructions. Dre showed me the ropes. But Steve looked at me funny in the middle of me splitting a wood plank into two. And at the end of the splitting, these hands reached past the blade that was spinning without pushing the button to stop the serrated steel from slicing and caught a fade. Twice. This right index finger got cut down to the white meat to ripe before flesh greets bone. This right middle finger, the innocent bystander, got grazed too. I was calm. I initially freaked once blood leaked out, but I breathed and prayed. If God got me, he got me. The ER nurse said great googly moogly when she saw me. I had yet to see that Ben Stiller movie, but Dre joked that my chances of being a hand model were no longer in sight. She, she was, was right. right. That was 2007. The nerves in this index finger ain't been right since. Can't tell if water or hair dryer is too hot for my skin until it burns it. Can barely grip a jar lid to turn it without having a wince. But these hands have since wiped thousands of tears, clenched hard fists but refused to hit, joined in holy matrimony, counted plenty money, Massage, loved, and lifted my baby up. What's messed up is, I was so caught up in the visible scars, I forgot how miraculous these hands are. Or, or were. were. It is 2023. Six weeks into chemo, and these hands ache. In the mornings, I awake to bone pain, fingertip joints strain before they get to work. I'm told it's normal, but these hands hurt. I clasp them and pray, do exercises from physical therapy, grip ice packs to get that old thing back, dream of the day they'll clap when the phrase cancer free is associated with me, of the days these fingers will simply be extremities. My gel manicure is no longer popping, but the only option to keep these now brittle nails from peeling in on themselves. These hands ain't never been simple, like me. These hands are both battered and blessed, like, like me. me. Today in 2023, I am stretched thin, still vigilant. I am grateful to be free from cancer, for now. Before COVID, I had plans to focus on my own projects. Instead of that, I helped others up until I felt ill. I miss those who didn't recover from cancer. I also miss spending so much time with my teens. I worry about them, my sister, my parents. And then I expand the lens of my concerns so many communities are trying to mend. I have learned that worries are often warranted, but caring and connection can sustain us. And I will continue to cut my hand around this candle of hope.
Today in 2023, I am happy. Mm. I am optimistic and nervous. Mm. Concerned and cautious. Worried and proud. Excited and curious. <laughs> Today in 2023, I am grateful to be able to complete my education in light of everything. Ugh. I am grateful to be surviving and doing well. Mm -hmm. To be chasing what I am passionate about. To be in college on a scholarship. To be living my dream as an actor. To be in school. Before COVID, I had plans to go away to school. <laughs> Instead of that, I opened the candle business. Oh. I had plans to go to school out of state. Instead of that, I went to a school near home. I miss spending more time at home. I miss being able to work on my self-development. I worry that my fears will be the reason I fail. I worry that I won't be able to find a career that I'm passionate about. Mm. I've learned that I no longer want to pursue a career in computer science. I've learned that I'm not entitled to win, and I will continue to put myself first. And I will continue to follow COVID protocols. <laughs> Before COVID, I had plans to attend all classes in person. Instead of that, I went to community college, did online classes for two years. I miss the in-person interactions, <laughs> being hands-on, etc. I worry that things will never fully be the same again. But I will continue to persevere through it all. Before COVID, I had plans to keep drawing. Instead of that, I write. I had plans to have a Ferris Bueller type day off for my senior year of high school. But instead of that, I took acting classes. I had plans to become a police officer. Instead of that, I opened up my own cleaning business. I miss spending time with my family. I miss joking that the pandemic wouldn't ever come to America. I miss nothing. <laughs> I worry that I'll have to move back home after I graduate. I worry about my future. I worry I might not be chasing enough. I have learned that writing is what I want to do. And I will continue to write every day. I've learned more about myself and how to have patience. I've learned that dreaming big and failing is better than dreaming small and thinking what could have been. I will continue to write every day. <laughs> I will continue to write comics. <laughs> and I will continue to do my best in school and to be a better me. fascinated by the way we empower ourselves to say no. How we can make it a comma or a period depending on how we feel, depending on our comfort level, and if we trust and believe that the relationship is real. And speaking of comfort, it's okay to listen to your body. Today, I'm glad that we are alive. Rather than worry about being on top, I'd rather have gratitude that we exist and avoid any guilt and shame for any moments that we have missed. I wonder if COVID really taught us the beauty of silence. Do we really truly honor time with self? Because of those times, we had to be where we had no other choice but to be. And today we look at the mere presence of good health as a luxury and we no longer allow people or things to shift what's already been done. Today in 2023, can we really give ourselves the permission to be free? Can we really stand here today to say that no matter the storms that come our way, can we really truly say that we've already won? Now, act two of Silence is Violence, the New Normal. 2026, featuring original pieces by Jessica Valores, Debkanye Mitra, Ashikile Finn, Maya Edmondson, Sherry Gonzalez, Dream, and Lakia Calloway. Musings 
from spring 2020. Maybe working from home will mean more plant babies, and more plant babies will mean more care and more empathy. And then maybe white supremacy can die for real this time. Maybe social distancing will help more people practice talking about healthy boundaries and consent. And some folks will finally see how much space they take up. And others will realize how much more space they deserve. Maybe essential workers will be paid like they are essential. And they can have a living wage. And dismantle the idea that work is a prerequisite for housing or food or basic human dignity. Maybe we'll see that the houseless deserve five-star hotels too, and there is enough food to go around, and people don't need to choose between baby formula and rent, and the basic needs can be fulfilled. And we can dream dreams beyond supply and demand. Maybe stimulus checks will remind us that Amazon didn't pay taxes, and that redistributing the wealth of the 1% could end poverty for good. And that reparations is possible. Maybe washing our hands will remind us of the sacredness of water. And we will kill the pipelines and free the land. Maybe quarantine will bring us back to our gardens. And with our hands in the soil, we'll start to ask whose land this is and give it back. Maybe we will slow down enough to listen to what the birds have to say. To notice the ozone repairing itself. And we will remember that we are earth beings with bodies that need time to rest, to digest, to pause. But it is spring 2021, and the broadcasts are preparing us to reopen. The algorithms have adjusted themselves. The ledgers are still calculating our worth. How many worlds have we lost? How many futures have we compromised? No one is immune. And so I call on the power of our being to put a moratorium on tomorrow's. We are banned from any unknown future until we can get things right today. You ask, how do I imagine this unknown future? And I refuse. I think I suffer from something called maladaptive daydreaming, where I sit with myself and my thoughts while the metro zips by from station to station. I've knocked over the first domino, and now I've got to brace myself for every single little collision that's going to result. It's anxieties because there's only anxiety and uncertainty. And it's easier to shelter my pain in these words until these words become the source of pain itself. It's in that web, that den of toxicity, dear 2026, I imagine. In 2026, my baby boy will turn four. In 2026, I will graduate college. In 2026, I will either get married or move the fuck on. In 2026, I will learn control. In 2026, I won't let anything break me. In 2026, I will survive the unimaginable. Because here in 2023, I am choosing my present. Because there's more to life than men, liquor, and money. Every memory of love that I share with my baby will live forever in my mind. And every lecture I sit through will meld into artistry that will melt into my soul. And every regret I have now will just be a shadow of a shadow of a memory that I won't miss in 2026. There's too much life in me to let go of it. Too much power that God has given me. Can't let go of it. I've got to hold on. I've got to hold on to what's only all right. Understand that I will shape this empty, imperfect space into my own joy scape. Because sometimes you have to say it out loud. Because no one asked and you can't wait. You can just barely survive in the darkness. You have that tenacity. But it's human to stretch and reach out and grasp every beam of light and cling so strong that each beam trembles in your grip. Dear me in 2026, give yourself a break. <laughs> 
You have already done so much for yourself. I know you're tripping because you only have two years until the age of 30. But relax, girl. You're still a young lady, even though you are reaching that age. You've become the wealthy film screenwriter and director you always wanted to become. And you even had the chance to work on Broadway with talented individuals like you. Give yourself credit and stay hopeful. You're not getting younger, so think on what you want next for your life. How do you feel about the goals you went after and caught? Do you have any other goals that you want to go after? <laughs> Take a break if you need to. You don't have to rush. You have your whole life ahead of you. Or do you, really? Don't think about it too much. Just live in the moment and quit making life harder than what it is. Give yourself a time to reflect and keep on keeping on. The world is beautiful. Go and continue to experience it and believe in yourself. You've already come this far. Keep setting higher heights and don't forget about the younger generation coming behind you. Set the bar high. <laughs> Dear me, in 2026, I hope you become a star. I hope you get in money. I hope you're becoming more stable or getting closer to being able to take care of others the way they took care of you. I hope you can travel back home. I hope you've learned so much of the things you wanted to learn. I hope you're completing or making all the art that you want. I hope you're away from people who won't give you peace. I hope you become a butterfly. So you can tell your father. Dear me in 2026, I hope I have accomplished my goals and get myself together. I hope I don't struggle like I did while being young, straight out of high school, not knowing to do with my life. I hope I'm already independent, like not needing help from my family, and have a good ass job and not be working in restaurants. Dear me in 2026, I hope you realize how much you've accomplished these past few years, but your job now is to keep moving forward and not look back. Whatever comes your way, don't think too much about it. As long as you keep your head in the game, you will win, period. Also, I hope you accomplished your goals and now got a home of your own. You know we really wanted that. Dear me in 2026, thank you for always looking out for me. You never let me down. You worked so hard to finally let your hair down. You are free. Free of all expectations and limitations, grounded as a tree. You can be me. This So yes, clearly there have been challenges so deep that it took us, shaked us, and surprised us. Although we can go on about its damages and attacks, there's no value in pulling us back. So instead, I'll look ahead and be grateful that this time actually revived us. It gave us new revelations and helped us to answer questions that was unspoken. Gave us new meaning to words that wasn't written. Gave us the courage to be released from people and things that wasn't giving. Gave us a clear new direction while redefining our focus. It helped us to kill the locust and made us aware of it. Because of COVID, we are no longer oblivious and we have more freedom to be protective with our own rejections in public. Our lives have been changed. But our lives also have been valued. We are priceless with or without war. It's time for us to live free with internal peace, honoring the silence of our sanity, producing a beautiful picture without a score, without a song, without a melody, just a smile of gratitude for the fact that we have made it. Cherish each other. 
and never let time pass without reveling in the beauty of our joy with a smile or a laugh. Thank you for coming out to tonight's production of Silence is Violence, The New Normal, a night of dreaming and reflection as the global pandemic turns three by Young Playwrights Theater. And now, the cast of Silence is Violence, The New Normal.